Welcome back to the Journal Club of Justice, an online journal club made up of a small group of friends who meet once a month to praise, scrutinize, and discuss research of the physical therapy nature, one article at a time. Could be new, could be old, but we feel it will create a good discussion that will influence our practice. We hope that you will get as much out of this as we do. We do ask you keep in mind new research is always coming out and progressing, so do not take any of what we say as medical advice, facts, or clinical suggestions. All right, it's episode five of the Journal Club of Justice. Welcome. My name is Dr. Adam Schwartz of Ron Mental. Uh, to my side here is student physical therapist Emily Malk. We also have Dr. April Ritz and Dr. Dillian Callier of the New Medical Notes podcast uh, joining us virtually here. I think we're in for a good discussion here as we are talking all things surrounding the female athlete triad. Female athletics have exploded in the past few decades, approaching nearly half of all high school athletes. Consequently, it has gotten more and more competitive, and this results in many trying everything they can to get an edge. Unfortunately, just like in male athletes, some are putting their health and futures at risk. Unlike male athletes, though, um, they're trying, instead of trying to cheat and increase size, they're on the other, other end of the spectrum. This can arguably be even more dangerous as the repercussions are quite severe. So without further ado, let's dive in and we'll discuss uh, what the female athlete triad is and what we can do to help. So this month's article was Treatment Strategies for the Female Athlete Triad and the Adolescent Athlete Current Perspectives. Uh, the main author was Jill Thien Niesenbaum, and this was published in the Journal of Sports Medicine in April of 2017. Did we lose April? We might have lost April. That's right, we'll keep rolling here and maybe she'll get back on here. Um, so Emily selected the article for this month. Um, Emily, do you want to talk about kind of how you found the article, why you t picked this topic? Um, well, just as like a female um, endurance athlete who, you know, ran collegiately and um, interested in a little bit of women's health as well, um, I've just been interested in this topic for a while. And so I really just did a basic Google Scholar search to see if what, you know, some of the most updated research I could find. And this isn't necessarily a research article, but more of kind of an explanation of what female athlete triad is and current treatments that are in use for, it's a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and so I thought it was just a really good article because a lot of people don't even understand what it is or how to treat it. For sure. Good stuff. Welcome back, April. Thank you. Sorry, you guys. Lost internet. <laughs> so, like we mentioned, this is uh, kind of a big deal because there's more and more female athletes uh, participating in the sports. You know, trying to navigate that realm of performance versus health. Um, does anybody have any kind of opening remarks or anything they want to jump into regarding this? Well, I was reading, this isn't in the article that we are going over tonight, but I was reading through my women's health physical therapy book that I have, um, and it's by Jean and Glenn Iron, and it was just saying before um, Title IX, in 1972, there's only two teams per school that were available for female athletes, and then in 2004, there was at least, there's over eight teams per school for female athletes. So just that huge jump, and I think... Um, as I was preparing for my women's health stuff today, realizing that women weren't even included into research studies until like the 1970s, 1980s. Oh, wow. So I think this is a huge, huge topic, and there's a lot more research being done, including women. Before that time, it was all done on men, and then those research studies were generalized over to women. So I think that's something just good to know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it really highlights the the explosion that we've had in female athletics. Um, so if anybody watching or listening um, is not familiar with the female athlete triad, um, it is comprised of three components, which is low energy availability, a low bone mineral density, and some sort of menstrual dysfunction. 
And I was actually surprised to read that you can have one of those or two of those or three of those and still kind of be considered um, to be having the female athlete triad. It's also more recently, um, there's different terms to more that have been used to describe it. And more recently, they started calling it relative energy deficiency in sports. So sometimes you'll find that in articles instead of female athlete triad. Um, I'm not sure if that's maybe a way to, well, different way of categorizing it. But. Yeah, and you might see different thing, different um, names for the three components. As, mm -hmm. as of 1997, the American College of Sports Medicine defined it as um, a defined eating disorder, amenorrhea, and osteoporosis. The problem with that was that those three components are very um, have, are very black and white. Yeah, they're very well defined, and there's a lot of women, you know, falling into some of the health issues regarding these, um, but do not meet the qualifications for um, those three. So, flash forward to 2007, they kind of revised um, how you define it and uh, use the terms energy availability. Um, with or without an eating disorder, menstrual dysfunction, and low bone mineral density. Because part of it is a lot of times people are focusing on the eating disorder, but some women, and men do this too, but they tend to just over overtrain and obsessively exercise, which also puts them into that same low energy availability just because they're not consuming as much as they are um, burning off when they exercise, yeah. but that's not considered really a eating disorder per se. Yeah, I'd agree with that. <clears throat> I think originally they, the uh, definition of it was too restrictive, and so they had to broaden it in order to, you know, create a bigger umbrella to encompass those who are still kind of struggling. Um, and that didn't have to be eating disorder, but what I've seen with more of the overtraining, it's not so much of the miles that they're putting in or the hours in the gym or the training. It's more of the sleep aspect where they're only getting four to six hours of sleep per night on top of, oh, I don't eat breakfast or on top of, oh, I usually have chips and chocolate milk for lunch on top of, oh, and I do four hours of training per day. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, you know, it's a little bit more almost holistic, you know, kind of thinking. Um, you got to, you know, be eating nutritious food to nourish your body so it can optimally function. Um, and maybe we should, you know, before we dive too far, maybe we should kind of define these. Um, low energy availability is as simple as, you know, calories in versus calories out. Um, Menstrual dysfunction is, where am I at here? Um, so it encompasses a large spectrum from a normal menses to amenorrhea, um, anything along there. April, do you ha can you kind of elaborate on that at all? Like what, what is within that spectrum? Yeah, so, so eumenorrhea is normal menses which is typically, I think, period between 24 to 35 days, okay? And then um, primary amenorrhea is just not having your period by the age of 15, okay? So normally, normally girls have their period between the ages of 12 to 14, and that's actually even lowering um, as time goes on. It's happening at younger ages. And then secondary amenorrhea is when you have your menstrual cycle, but you go at least three months without it, okay? And th these amenorrheas could be caused due to multiple factors. It could be due to, it could be female athlete triad if they have low um, energy availability causing all this menstrual dysfunction, but it can also be due to a lot of other hormone imbalances in the body. And then oligomenorrhea is having a normal period, but it's over 35 days and cycle. So there's a lot of different terms for it, and that's why there's a large spectrum. Gotcha. So good. Um, and then we have the low bone mineral density, um, which they use a, a DEXA scan 
Um, and basically you get the, there's no like absolute values. They kind of look at, you know, everybody as a whole at a given population. And if you fall kind of within the realm of what most people are at or like the average, then you're, you're good. If you fall a standard deviation below that, then you'd be considered to have low bone mineral density. That's just two. Hmm? Oh, two. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. I think it's also, an, oh, sorry, Emily. I think it's really important too to also like understand that typically research with the T scores um, was done in Caucasian postmenopausal women. So typically they don't like to use like the terms osteopenia or osteoporosis in adolescents um, just because like the research has been done mainly on the postmenopausal women. So what like Emily said, for adolescents and premenopausal women it's are less than two standard deviations below. And so something that I actually just this past week started my women's health seminar. I um, mean, we touched on female tri athlete triad just a little bit. And that was something that we had talked about was super important was the low um, bone mineral density. Maybe you don't develop osteoporosis as a 20 year old, but that time of like 15 to 20 years old is when you need to be building your bone bank or storing <laughs> as much calcium as possible. So if instead you're in this, low bone mineral density, then later on it's going to affect you um, sooner and possibly harder than someone who didn't have female athlete triad, which is, you know, especially in sport, the sports that it's kind of more common in are those endurance sports or sports where, um, you know, body, um, what am I trying to say, body awareness and um, just the way you look is more important. So those are, can also be sports where if you have low bone mineral density, you're going to get injured more often. Yeah. Um, and it's also, at least in running, especially in running, um, where, you know, a lot of people try to become as lean and as small as you can in order to optimize that strength to weight ratio. Um, and then that'll thus improve your power output, allow you to run faster, which works in the short term. However, as you do that, you know, you start to get closer and closer to those um, health risks that start encompassing with not consuming enough caloric intake. And then, you know, your performance suffers from that consequently. And then you, it's a long haul to try to dig yourself out of that hole. So not only, so not only do you have like the performance issues, um, there's also a lot of just I think societal kind of um, standards that, you know, people try to meet. Um, Cause you know, especially on the spectrum, on the side of like an eating disorder, less so than the excessive exercising, um, you have kind of all the psychosocial factors of people, you know, being worried about how they look, um, uh, their, their self-esteem with comparing themselves around um, comparing themselves to those around them um, as well celebrities teammates anybody and everybody that's kind of within their eye so it is kind of like what you guys are talking about it's just kind of like a big cycle like so you only have to have one of them to really be considered female athlete triad but it is a big circle because I was like reading and so people without a period or amenorrhea they have, they have decreased estrogen, which leads to increased bone turnover and bone resorption, which leads to decreased bone density, which leads to stress fracture, stress, stress back fractures. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but I think it's important because normally these people are typically pretty healthy until they have something that comes up like a stress fracture, and that's the first time they're seen in the healthcare system. And I think it's really important for whoever's seeing them, the doctor, and then if they get referred to physical therapy, for us to be picking up on the other signs and asking questions and screening for the other things, such as are you having regular periods and 
things like that and kind of asking about their eating habits because they can go through the, they can go through their high school years without being picked up on at all that they're having all these issues and I know growing up and playing tons of sports in high school if you didn't have your period well you don't really tell anybody you just think it's normal because you hear your other friends aren't really having their period and it could be due to a whole thing of a whole a whole list of issues but you don't bring it up to your parents you don't talk to your doctor about it and then you get in college and later on realize that was a time that was super important to be growing that bone density and if you're not having that period you need to be on the calcium and vitamin d supplements and it's i think it's just super important that we're picking up on that and asking our younger female athletes about the important questions definitely and to tag on to that um being you know part of an endurance sport you hear sometimes that stigma of people are like oh i haven't had my period in so long that must mean i'm in shape you know yeah. that means I'm at the top of my game when i'm really you know you could be on the downslope because of that but for some reason there's just that stigma that oh i'm working out so hard i'm not having my period that's a good thing that's not <laughs> yeah it almost kind of becomes kind of like you're bragging about you know not having your period at that age and you don't realize how much of a harm it is yeah Definitely. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, you get the same thing about other stuff too, like the people that can only sleep or can get away with sleeping like four hours a night. Yeah. Um, you know, that's awesome right now. But what about in five, 10, 20 years from now? Like, that's probably not going to be have a good outlook. Yeah, very healthy. Yeah. Or going along the uh, spectrum of women's health, the ladies who kind of pee themselves a little bit while they jump rope. Yeah, not normal. <laughs> See, women's health therapists use uh, muscles. Not normal. <laughs> Is there more you wanted to say there, Dylan? Or <laughs> no, no, it's just you know that that's also um, just some common things out there that people are writing about that yeah they don't realize are not yeah. healthy. Exactly. Mind yeah, like that CrossFit, the CrossFit video that came out about lifting and how peeing your pants is normal and yeah one of my friends that i work with she's a physical therapist and she does a lot of heavy lifting like in chicago and st louis and she's actually doing a blog right now about that and how how urinating when lifting is not normal and how if you're doing that now at a young age you need to get help because when you have kids you're gonna have a whole lot more issues especially down the road when you're in your 60s 70s and 80s yeah definitely and talking about when we yeah talking about when we first see these patients walk in um i think stress fractures are like the the textbook example but most of what i've seen with patients who are struggling with this or one of the components of the triad is multiple injuries and so i think throwing in a question there of okay so you're a young female athlete how often have you been having these injuries or how often have you been having knee problems or hip problems or maybe it's uh one time it's the ankle and the next time it's the hip the next time it's the knee and it's all within like a year or six months like um asking those questions kind of probing a little bit deeper and seeing um where you need to go from there and Dylan, i don't know about you but i've seen some people that are like extreme dancers and um they're struggling with anorexia and they often have, I feel like personally, they have a lot harder time of dealing with their pain and getting better because their body doesn't have the nutrition it needs to heal. Yeah, I mean, that recovery is very, very encompassing. You know, making sure you're eating enough, make sure you're sleeping, you're you know, drinking your water. Um, and m probably most importantly, modulating that training load so that you're not going to end up in a caloric deficit um, and then continuing that cycle. Because if you keep training at the same intensity, assuming you're not having an injury or something that keeps you from training, you keep going at that intensity or that volume. And even though you increase you know, your caloric intake, it might not be enough to dig you out, out of that hole unless you want to hang out there for a long time. Um, but nobody's really, wanting to do that I don't think yeah and that was one of the things when they were talking about kind of jumping ahead a little bit but when they're talking about treatment was 
um, you know, making sure someone is monitoring their, you know, what they're supposed to be eating and making sure that that, you know, when they're resuming activity, that they're not going into a caloric deficit. Um, and that was one of the assigned roles they gave to the physical therapist slash athletic trainer, which that is an issue I did have with this article was I felt like they gave the physical therapist like very limited, like that they're like, Oh, this is what the physical therapist should do. And I felt like that definitely could have been expanded upon, but yeah. maybe that's just my own bias. But I think they might've had that kind of perspective mostly because you probably see this mostly in the high school and collegiate realm mm -hmm. where people athletic where athletes. athletes are, you know, first, talking with their coaches and athletic trainers before they seek somebody outside of the school system to, to find, find treatment for this. Um, so, you know, but they do mention, you know, if that athletic trainer was not available, then, you know, physical therapy would be like your next best option. Or I don't know about bet, Next best, I we're probably pretty equivalent. I don't want to step on any toes or do anything like that, but uh, it's out of convenience. Athletic trainer is probably your go-to there in that situation. Yeah, and it's more of the like it's like you're going to pick up on this stuff in the subjective. Like any anybody can ask questions. Parents can notice this. It doesn't have to be a medical professional, and you can be like, hey, uh, you know, sit down, have a talk. We need to maybe get you checked out and. Uh, see where we need to go from here uh, but yeah I think you know all along the entire road of healthcare practitioners or athletic trainers and within that um, coaching spectrum as well uh, anybody can pick up on this yeah definitely I love the point they make I don't know if it was in the discussion or at some point where they mentioned that you know it's not just it's not just the healthcare practitioners you know it's important for coaches, parents, their teammates, you know, even friends around them to be kind of aware of this. And, you know, if something does kind of look a little off that they can, you know, hopefully approach them in a safe manner that's not really attacking. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, start asking questions that they're curious and they care about them and they want to help and make sure they're in an okay place. Because, um, I mean, they, nobody wants to see their friends, teammates, um, family members, etc., you know, getting hurt or in an unhealthy situation. So let's maybe go over some management strategies uh, that we have for these. Um, I feel like we, we touched on, you know, kind of defining them and different aspects of each of them. Um, so, I mean, low with the low energy availability, I mean, that, that's as easy as, you know, figuring out what you need to be consuming, how much you're currently consuming, and how you can kind of balance that out a little bit better. Um, probably getting together with some sort of dietitian, nutritionist, or somebody who is knowledgeable in that realm um, be a case where we might want to refer out um, for any physical therapist, athletic trainer, et cetera, to uh, maybe listening. Just quick question for you guys. Do you guys have a dietitian that you guys have worked with? That's something I know I need to work on finding a dietitian um, in our hospital system. Uh, no, but um, the course I went to last weekend with Adrian Lowe, uh, he mentioned that a lot of like major grocery store chains will have nutritionists on staff. So there's like quite a few high V's around where he's at in Iowa and he knows a nutritionist there and will refer patients to just to their local grocery store where they're going already um, to kind of speak with them. Same. So that might be something to look into. Um, the other thing about the low energy availability is that, you know, if there is the eating disordered, you know, part to it or, even over exercising, if it's not something that's an unintentional, like they're not realizing how much they're, you know, they're not consuming enough to maintain, um, there should probably be some mental health referral there as well. 
Yes, just yeah, definitely. a nutritioner or a dietitian or even their coaches, like that's really not going to have as much of an impact. All right. So, and then the menstrual dysfunction. Um, I'll refer to you, April. <laughs> All right. Not an expert at this, but I'll Maybe play what I know. Basically, what I what I know. So is refer to a woman's health or speak with an endocrinologist or your OBGYN, yep. something like that. So. Yeah, so to really make sure that the menstrual dysfunction is actually occurring because of low energy availability, they first need to go through the gynecologist um, and have everything ruled out, and then endocrinologists get everything ruled out. And if all that shows up negative, then it can be due to um, low energy availability. Um, but there's, there's so many different reasons why they might be having um, irregular periods. It could be, you know, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome is one. Um, there's so many, different, so many different reasons. And I, one part I did like is that I didn't know how long was normal for resumption of menses without a pharmacological intervention. And that's 15 months. So that's it's quite a long time, yeah. but that's just due to low low energy availability, and they s increase their caloric intake, and it says very slowly, gain of approximately one pound a week, and then a resumption of menses should occur within about 15 months. And if anybody's interested, I actually follow a women's health therapist, Dr. Susie Grozinski, and on her blog this past week, she actually had a women's health um, like specialist um, who talked about irregular periods and she focuses on just working with women who are younger and helping them return get their periods back just by nutrition and healthy living and not based on like contraceptives and medications so I thought that was really interesting yeah and they, they mentioned in here that uh, Conservative, non-pharmacological is really kind of your your best first option there. And then if mm -hmm. all else fails, then we can start to look into um, the pharmacological ways to manage that. Okay. I really liked how it. Oops, sorry, Adam. Go I was going to say I really liked how it did say that oral and non-oral contraceptives for menstrual dysfunction have been studied extensively and are not recommended. Because I feel like personally, when I was going dealing with some of this stuff. Um, my doctors were just trying to pres prescribe contraceptives to me, and I was like, can we actually, like, look into what's going on and not just be given meds to, to kind of cover up what's going on? So I think that's something that's really important for athletes to know and girls that are going through this. I agree. I feel like that kind of makes sense, though, and obviously medications are not within my scope, but handing out contraceptives, wouldn't that kind of – isn't the job of that to make it less often or more regular? And then if it's not occurring at all, I don't see that, you know, really providing any benefit. Um, whereas other areas, I can definitely see that making 100% sense. But uh, I kind of agree with that with the article as well. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've always just thought of um, like oral contraceptives as it's one medication that you put into your body to change what's actually supposed to be happening to your body for the good. It's like telling your body something different than what it's supposed to be doing. So April, I got a question for you. Yep. I'll try to answer it. How can you ovulate but not have menstruation? Oh, that's, I'm not going to even try to answer that right now because okay. I'd have to look into that. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I think because you're because you have to have like your follicular phase, you have to be able to grow the follicle, and it has to be able to, for like fully develop. Um, but I'm not the best with the whole, the whole cycle and each step by step. You have to have certain hormones, and I'd have to look into that to give you an answer. <laughs> Fair enough. They just mentioned it a couple times, so yeah, I, you know, associated that happening together. So I was it's, just curious. Yeah, it's supposed to happen together, but I think if the follicular phase doesn't occur and it doesn't fully develop, then you can ovulate without having a menstrual cycle or 
administration of the bleeding. And the big thing of managing all of these is making it as individualized as you can. Now, everybody responds to, everybody's first off at a little bit different place in their life and their understanding and what they're, you know, ready to make change in. Um, so you kind of have to work within their realm and do what you can with that. Um, and there's actually, they, they mentioned a couple articles here where they, you know, it's like the same, I think it's the same athlete, you know, same position, responding really well to, you know, slightly different programs, um, all depending on kind of what their deficits are um, in, terms of, in terms of the three components. Um, I, I thought, you know, that was big to hit home. We, we always think about individualizing treatment, but how often if you go back and look at what you're doing with everybody, how individualized is it really? You know, we all kind of have our go-to things that we, we utilize um, and we can kind of, it's easy to get caught in that trap kind of doing the same thing with every patient. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So treating bone mineral density. Um, you, it, it, bone is just another connective tissue in the body. So we have to, you know, apply appropriate amount of stress so that it is, you know, how do I say it? it appropriate amount of stress that stimulates it to produce growth and to make it a little bit stronger. Too much, and it starts to break down. Too little, and it starts to break down as well. Um, so, you know, you first gotta, gotta start with like weight-bearing exercise. Um, exercise being that big piece there, because what we know from, if I remember right, from school in like the spinal cord literature, uh, you put people in like a standing frame where they're just mm -hmm. weight-bearing, and that's still not enough to help with that bone renter density. You have to have that muscle pull on the bone uh, to stimulate adaptation. Um, and this has to be in a, a slow, progressive manner. Bone is not something that responds super fast. When you have a fracture, you have that eight week, give or take a little bit, you know, um, healing process that occurs and you really can't do much to accelerate that or slow it down there's no well actually we can do a few things to slow it down uh, that we would not recommend <laughs> but you can't really cheat physiology you have to you know be patient with it yep. and I like that they talked about um, resistance training because I feel like that's something that kind of gets overlooked still the yeah. importance of resistance training so yeah for sure and then, yeah I feel like Oh, go ahead. I, was, I feel like a lot of people with osteoporosis that are older and get the diagnosis of that, I feel like they're not really, I feel like they should be referred to therapy to learn exercises they can be doing to help with that. I don't think we see that enough. Yeah, I'd agree. And even when we do, I feel like... I messed up once or twice before. <laughs> okay, now we're recording again. So, part two, Journal Club of Justice, episode five. five. <laughs> Um, we're talking bone mineral density here, um, and as we start to dig ourselves, you know, out of the hole in that female athlete triad, and we're starting to get, uh, you know, a nice base of resistance training, we're maybe starting to, you know, do more weight-bearing exercises such as running, help build that bone mineral density. We have to remember that we are dealing with athletes. We need to hit that sport-specific sport phase, doing more um, ballistic, uh, plyometric-type exercises. Um, so as we know, depending on the reference you're looking at, um, running and what joint you're looking at, uh, running is two to three times your body weight that you're having to um, accept and absorb. Thank you. The plyometrics can be as much as 20 times your body weight. So dosed appropriately, that can be huge to help drive up that bone mineral density and at least help to prolong um, your development of osteoporosis later in life if you get it at all. Anything specific you guys want to mention on any of the components? No? Pretty good? Um, awesome. I think we, we covered those pretty well. Um, any closing remarks you guys have?
Um, for you guys who have seen patients kind of struggling with the triad or one component or two components, how have you had that conversation with the patient? And I'm, Adam, say that again. Oh. I'm it, thinking it, it, uh, it. one not having not one not struggling with um, like an eating disorder, but just maybe not getting enough calories in, um, not having enough sleep, putting in those ridiculous amount of hours for training. Um, how do you have that conversation with a patient that is struggling with one or two components of the triad? You know, I haven't, you know, I haven't thankfully had any, you know, athletes or individuals that I would suspect are having, you know, female athlete triad specific issues. Um, but I would, I would describe it as, you know, you have the, you have your spectrum of health and performance and really these need to be merged and they're all absolutely the same. You know, your best performance occurs when you're healthy when that health is lacking you're not eating enough you're not sleeping well etc you can't perform well you can't train well um, so that's kind of probably the the way i would go about you know getting them to kind of reshape their mindset around the situation and their perspective um i don't know that it's a discussion of be like hey you're doing I wouldn't be like so black and white about it as you're doing X amount and burning this many calories. You need to be eating this, you know, you need to be doing X, Y, Z. I would take more of a, a, a stance of trying to just kind of reshape their thinking about it. Like you said, um, and let, let them kind of ultimately come to that conclusion of them needing to make changes um, rather than us telling them they need to do X, Y, Z. Because ultimately, if, if it's the patient making that decision, that's such a, there's going to be such, so much stronger, like, behavioral shift in them. Buy-in. And, and buy-in, yeah, is a perfect way to, to put that. Thank you. Um, as opposed to, you need to do these exercises, eat this much, and maybe if they're a highly motivated individual and they kind of hear what you're saying and, you know, you have a good therapeutic alliance, that works but in someone who's maybe quite not sold yet, you know, they, they kind of need to come to that or isn't ready to make that change. You know, we have our readiness to change scale, which is something I want to kind of learn a little more about in the coming year or so is if you're not ready to change, I mean, what are you going to do? It's like anybody, you know, that's smoking, you're like, Hey, you should stop that. And you tell them 10,000 times, like nobody just stops smoking unless they want to do it. Hmm. The, the two patients that I've had um, that had this were both younger high school athletes. And it was beneficial because they both came with their, like one of the parents, their mothers. And so usually that helped with my subjective um, evaluation. So I asked and then I kind of pulled mom to the side. It's like, hey, is, you know, how's the menstruation going? Um, how's her eating? How's her sleeping? Stuff like that. Because you do see like them coming in every day tired. It's not just like a once, once at a time. It's like after school and they're like falling asleep on the plinth or they're just looking tired. They're looking groggy. Um, and then you ask more, it's like, oh, what'd you eat for breakfast this morning? Oh, I skipped it. Um, and then what'd you have for lunch? And same thing. It's like a bag of chips or they got like a Snickers bar and like some, some drink or ice cream bar or something. Um, and so usually I will ask them to start either – eating an actual lunch or sometimes they don't have the appetite. And so I tell their moms to go to like Walmart and get like bolt house uh, smoothies for them, which are super cheap, like five to six bucks for a big, like half gallon of it, which I'm drinking now. <laughs> yeah. This is not an ad. Wait, yeah, this is not an ad. We have no affiliation. <laughs> not <a sponsor. laughs> if you want to bolt house, you know, send me a link. I'll get a, we'll get something going here. <laughs> And I'm sure there are some uh, sugar Nazis out there that would ha that hate those, but it, it's an easy way. Smoothies are an easy way for young athletes who don't have that appetite to get calories in. We're going back to that basic equation, calories in versus calories out, and then making sure they're like, okay, getting motivated to return to sport, 
you're not sleeping enough. You need to respect yourself a little bit more, put down the phone, just go to bed um, type of thing. And uh, usually the mothers are all about it. They want to take care of their kids. And so once they get a little support at home, the, the buy-in and the follow-through is a little bit greater as well. Hey, Dylan, I have a question for you. What were the diagnoses of those two girls you had? Uh, one was patellofemoral disorder. Yeah. And the other was uh, a combination of knee pain and ankle pain. Yeah. Uh, that's a nice pitch there, Dylan. I mean, that's not, you know, most people might just treat the knee and the ankle, you know, and not, you know, ask those further questions. Uh, so definitely, you know, props to you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Like I said, it, it's just, it's those recurring things that you notice or, oh yeah, you know, uh, I hurt my knee two months ago and before that I hurt it, you know, two months before that too. And it's just this recurring stuff. And that could be a biomechanical thing, absolutely. But they come in tired that every single time. That's usually my, my key factor that I tune in on. Yeah, I think that's really important. I also I like it when the parents come in because they listen more and they're more concerned sometimes, I think, than the, the patients we're seeing in themselves, like the younger girls. Um, yeah. But one thing that I kind of always go back to is like the vitamin D and calcium too. And I know we can't tell people to necessarily take that. But I explained to the girls about like the bone, the bone density and how later on down the road, they have poor bone density can lead to like increased fractures. And then typically they're like, okay, so what do I need to be doing about that? And I tell them to go back to their, you know, GYN or primary care physician and ask them about calcium and vitamin D supplements so they can get started on those. I always have them, I always write down on a piece of paper and give it to them and tell them, who knows if they really talk to their parents about it or what actually happens with it, but I, at least I tell them. Yeah, yeah I think parents are more concerned about the long-term effects of everything yeah. that's going on. Um, whereas, I mean, you know, 16-year-old me, I, I didn't even think about like two weeks from now. I still don't <laughs> think two weeks from now. I kind of live just day by day. <laughs> but um, definitely the parents help with uh, follow-through as well. And actually, um, so in Missouri, physical therapists can't say anything about supplementation or nutrition. But in California, it's within our scope. So if you're in California, take your calcium and vitamin D. Can you, in California, can you tell them like grams and things like that? Or can you just tell them, I recommend you to take it and follow the doctor for like how much? Um, I didn't, I was just reading the... Uh, the coursework that I needed for the CLE or the California licensure exam. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think as long as it fell within general nutrition recommendations, any healthcare provider can do it. Okay. But I don't know what would be considered like specific dietary recommendations. Yeah. Typically it's like a gray area. Yeah. As with most things. Yep. That's okay. Gray, gray's good. It means we can do more. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, nice job, guys. I just want to finish with, um, you know, a couple key points here. Um, that optimal health, optimal performance is really needs to be synonymous. Um, there are no shortcuts to success. You just have to be... You know, the key is being patient and being consistent with the work you put in and having a slow, methodical progression with it. Um, and in time, you know, you'll get to where you're wanting to go as opposed to trying to yo-yo success and, and down, ups and downs um, through, through th some of these things we talked about here, um, pulling you into the, the female athlete triad. Um, anything else, guys? Um, my clinical takeaway is table two, the screening questions. I am going to um, write those up and then have them on my work computer. Yeah, perfect. Have any female athletes of that age, I can just go through all those questions and get yes or no answers to all of them. Yeah, easy. You know, you can run through those probably 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, nice way to kind of screen for that, see if you need to delve further into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Awesome. Don't anything on your end? Are you good? Uh, I think I'm good. I, with one of those patients, I did end up having to call um, the physician's assistant that I was working with. And, you know, uh, for a clinician that might be listening to this, that phone call is really just call them up and say, hey, um, just concerned about a patient. And I wanted to call on the patient's behalf. We're having some energy problems. And I know she's an athlete. And she may or may not have been struggling with some menstruation um, in the past. Uh, also, sounds like she's not getting a lot of sleep. But I just wanted to reach out to you and let you know if you wanted to do any more check uh, with um, female athlete triad or anything like that with bone mineral density. Um, ultimately, I'm an extension of your practice and just really want to take care of the patient from here. So if you want me to continue to work with her or if you want to see her back in, I just want to give you that heads up. And that's basically how the phone call went. Um, it's just it's a really nice way of making sure the patient gets taken care of, but also not overstepping boundaries or um, getting anybody angry at you or saying, oh, you need absolutely need this test. Why haven't you gotten this already? Sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Awesome advice. Emily, you got anything for us or I think we got everything pretty good? Okay, awesome. All right, guys. So this is... Closing of episode five in the Journal Club of Justice. Um, again, this article was titled Treatment Strategies for the Female Athlete Triad and the Adolescent Athlete, Current Perspectives. Lead author was Jill Thien Niesenbaum. Um, and it was published in the journal Sports Medicine in April of 2017. Um, great article, highly recommend you check it out. Um, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, whatever, um, please you know send myself a message and we will try to grow, make this better. Um, we obviously want to encourage um, improvement in not only our practices, but you know the profession as a whole. Um, so please don't hesitate to, to shoot us something that's on your mind. Um, if there's any specific topics or studies you guys want our our thoughts on, uh, please let us know, and we will try to get that on the schedule um, and do that as well. So this is the Journal Club of Justice signing out until next month.